Okay, so let's. Uh, so thank you for our sponsors. Um, definitely chat with them. A lot of great people there. Um, okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, Okay. Is that better? Am I like not blowing out the microphone? Okay. I, I talk loud. So, a um, little bit about me. Um, I'm Mark Steffen. Um, I mentor and help a lot of people in interviewing simply because I like interviewing. I love interviewing people. I love trying to figure out how I can twist the little brain and figure out what's really in there. But also at the same time, I like interviewing because I like it when people are trying to twist my brain. So I wonder sometimes what's in there. Um, and so I, I'm the founder of Product Hire. I've been a product manager for 18 some years in some form. And uh, I'm an organizer of Product Tank Austin. And uh, ooh, this is an old slide. I am also a, a product, a head of product meetup called Product Hire Job Club, um, which is a meetups focused on helping people get product jobs and we just had one last week for this week so awesome okay so uh just so you guys know join the product in austin slack this is a slack community channel for all the community the reason i tell this because i don't know if you're in the last talk but relationships matter and the product community in austin if you weren't looking for a job uh, definitely go to product in austin there's a place to invite yourself to the slack community um, definitely, product team people are on there, everybody's on there. So, and we ran through this this morning, but if definitely go ahead and check out people on LinkedIn. Um, again, the, uh, and I, not this topic this morning, but the number one way to find a job is to know people who are looking for jobs or hiring for jobs um, and networking. Uh, applying on a job board is probably the least likely way you're able to find a job. So, just FYI. Seriously, <laughs> Okay, so what, we're, what are we going to cover today? Um, so we're going to talk about why whiteboarding is important. Um, and we're going to talk about some things to remember when you're generally whiteboarding. We're going to go over a product design whiteboarding template, and then an estimation analytical template, and a prioritization template. And then I'll just give you some examples um, actually, I think I removed examples because of the time limitations, but and we'll see what's there. Uh, and definitely, I'm going to try to save time for Q and A. So, why is whiteboarding important? And so, you know, I mean, guys, you guys are smart. Anybody here not smart? Just so I can definitely. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, we all know this, but I just I think it's important to reiterate that whiteboarding this group uh, demonstrates your communication. Uh, skills and as product people, whether you're a product manager, product marketing, product design, product fill in the blank, um, or as a human in marriage, um, and communication is important. Um, and it's also important for visualizing your thoughts. So, you know, anybody read Plato's Allegory of the Cave? Uh, I'm sure you know everything we're thinking is not. It's just a representation of something that's real, and so. Just, you know, kind of draw it out and at least get a little bit better representation of it. Um, also, the great thing about whiteboarding and drawing and writing out things is it gives you time to think about the answer as you're doing something. Um, it's stalling, and you know, we all know stalling is important because this morning we had some difficulties and we were coming up with ways to stall. So um, it gives you time to think. It also gives you, it helps you organize your thoughts, and I'm really going to get into this is that proper whiteboarding helps you organize your thoughts, um, but it also helps your interviewer see your organization of thoughts and not get lost. There's nothing worse than doing an interview and your interviewer gets lost and they get bored and then they zone out, right? And I've been in some of those interviews where, oh my gosh, I have no idea what, what they're doing up on that wall, on that whiteboard. Um, if they even use the whiteboard. If they don't use the whiteboard, good luck, right? Um, it also helps you create, you know, a lot of whiteboarding involves brainstorming, and so, of course, it helps you in that brainstorming process and helps you not get lost during that process. And we'll see what I mean here. 
So things to remember, and I call these brain dead tips. So this is for those who said you're not very smart. Definitely, uh, I'll be sharing these slides because apparently these would be not, you, um, you don't know these. Um, so why, write clearly, right? Whiteboarding only helps if they can read it or understand it, right? Obvious, but important. Rewrite the questions in your words and confirm, and I'll definitely dig into this one. Uh, so many people just start off writing the answer or, or doing the work, and they don't actually create a basis of, what are we solving? Do we agree what we're solving, right? What is the goal? Um, do I understand the question? The whiteboard is very useful in this. Uh, and so write the goal, so again, writing the goal of what you're doing, actually write it down, because when you get to the solution, you draw a big line to the goal and says, does this answer your question, or should I go back and, read and dig deeper into one of these areas that I discussed? If your viewer has one or two choices, they can say, go back, I didn't understand this part. Or they might say, yes, this answers the question, and they just created a confirmation in their subconscious that says, answer the question. You can always reframe it. You can always say, Did I answer? is this a great answer for the question? And if they say yes, then they subconsciously said it's a great answer. It's a wonderful mind game you can play with your interviewer. Um, you can uh, write your structure. So one of the things I'll get into this is actually write down stuff on how you're going to approach the problem before you approach the problem. That helps create a roadmap for the interviewer. Draw, illustrate, diagram, question, product design. If you're like, make a refrigerator with a blind or whatever, you know, draw it. Uh, don't stop talking when thinking and writing. So a lot of times people clam up and they go silent. Do not go silent. I'm not saying battle, right? What I'm saying is the interviewer is trying to figure out how you think, and if you go silent, they're not understanding how you think, which is important for the interview. Um, of course, uh, at the same time, um, you know, oh, I put it up there, don't talk too much. <laughs> so definitely organize what you're talking about. Don't be defensive. Interviewers, I don't know how many of you have done whiteboarding interviews, but interviewers will often change the goal. They'll say, like, you know, let's use a, a build a refrigerator for the blind. And you know, like you're all the way towards the end, and they said, and you're building a blind refrigerator for from your refrigerator, blind refrigerator, right? A refrigerator for the blind for a family, and then all they said, well, what if this was for a school? Interesting. Let's go back all the way up, and if you created a, a scaffolding, you go right back up to where users come in, and then you start again. And that's really great if you organize yourself. And so definitely don't be like defensive, like, oh, you cheated me, right? Don't do that, because they want to see how you pivot. Uh, diverge in brainstorming, so definitely open up in brainstorming, uh, but then converge, actually get to solutions. I'll talk about that. Use the entire whiteboard. I can't tell you how many people just make use of And you're like, what the? And then they're in front of, of, of all things. And you're just like, thank you for using something that is absolutely had no value to the interview. Um, demand to use a whiteboard. So I demand it, right? When I interview, I demand to use a whiteboard. Um, in fact, when I do phone interviews, I beg. I, I verge on demanding. It should be a video interview. And anybody who has a video take who has video with me in my office? Oh come on, I know a video. Yeah, there's some people here. You see a huge whiteboard. We go to the next point, buy a big whiteboard, okay? We don't deal with these dinky little things. Like huge whiteboard, right? Three by six, four by six, four by eight. You know, go find a nunchuck because that's where I find mine. It's really <laughs> one of the little ones, but it works. And uh, bring your dry erase markers. I can't tell you how many people are impressed when, you know, you're, I can't, you're like, the dry erase does run out. So don't trust the company you're interviewing with. I actually pull out a thing, I'm like, no, no problem, I got it right. They're like, you're so prepared. And I'm like, you betcha. <laughs> so, and of course, two video. These are just brain dead tips. Trust me, every single one of them has gotten me bonus points. And when I've interviewed people, every single one of them has given people bonus points for doing them. When you're interviewing, it's not about, you know, it, it's about just being better than the other guy. And the other guy will do so much, you need to do more. So just know that every little point, you know, if you're on the borderline, it will matter. Okay, the rule of three. Who knows the rule of three? No, okay, well. There's so many rules of three. There's so many rules of three. Thank you. There's three rules of the rule of the three. Um, no, so the main thing 
is that people tend to be able to store in their mind three things and compare easily three things. So we like to compare three things. And, um, and so every time you give a problem, you give three problems. Every time you have a solution, give three solutions. By the way, this is really great in prioritization. Uh, makes it easy. And then always set up your three comparisons to make it easy to prioritize. So don't make them all like equally the same. Like make something super complex, make something attainable from technology, and then make something like maybe doesn't even use technology as a solution. Um, I often do that um, and recommend people do that in Google interviews simply because one is a moonshot, one is utilizing and showing your use of current technology, and then one is Maybe we don't need technology or a super completely like R&D budget to make something simple. And so always think about that. And it makes it easy to prioritize. So let's get to estimation analytical whiteboard. So who's done these type of questions? One, are you serious? What is Austin doing? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are awesome questions. I adore these questions. I adore giving these questions. Um, an example, how many fish are in the Pacific Ocean? A lot. A lot. No, well, no. you just failed. <laughs> um, so this is, this is how, basically, this measures how you can make decisions and gather mathematical estimates, basically with very little information on the quick. And so that's why I love these things, because it shows you how you think, and it shows you, you know, how you do with math, right? And I, I'm not going to go into really how to answer these, I'm going to show you how to use a whiteboard. I can give a whole other class on how to answer these questions. But, as you see here, what I say at the top, at the top of your whiteboard, rewrite the question in your own words. So if they say, how many fish are in the Pacific Ocean, right? So you actually change that when you write it down, and you say, um, how many, I don't know, let me think about what you're right. So I was actually pretty, I think I actually put the summation there. I think, I think the original question was, um, how many, um, uh, I don't know, I forget what it is. But you rewrite the question in your own words. And the reason you do that is because you're trying to create, a, negotiating a common language that you're using, and you're making sure that you, you understand the question properly, and the only way to do that is to change the question a little bit to make sure that you're agreeing on kind of what that is. And you might have to go iterate through that. And like, no, I actually did Like another one is, uh, how many terabytes, this is actually a Google question, uh, how many terabytes is required to street view all of San Francisco, right? Um, and so, you know, you would actually rewrite that into an interesting question. The second thing you're gonna put is, what is the goal? So at the end of this question, how do I know I answered the question? So you're going to put the goal is terabytes in, in a system to measure street view, right? Terabytes. So the question can be terabytes. Whatever the goal is, like is it fish or is it living organisms or whatever, you need to put the goal there. It's important that you both agree on the goal because when you get to the answer, you need to point back to that goal and just say, did this, is this a great answer to the goal of this question? And they will go again and say yes or no. So start off knowing what you're going for. And there's another reason you write it down, just to be clear, is who gets lost when you're answering a question? Everybody. So you're actually like, okay, am I actually, as you're going through your scaffolding, you're like, am I still answering this question, right? It's there for the interviewer, but it's also there for yourself. Um, also, immediately, like, these are the first things I do. Immediately what I do is like, okay, so this is how I'm going to answer the question. I'm going to write down what I know. I'm going to put my, what I don't know. I'm going to put kind of the assumptions I made, and then I'm going to write down some edge cases. I put them in the four corners, and I actually write these things down. The good thing is that I'm actually telling the interviewer how I'm going to approach this question. And so, you know, I, then I can start re refining the thing. Like, okay, so, you know, how many fish are in the ocean? Well, are we counting, you know, are we, you know, counting what type of fish? Are we like definition of fish? Are we counting dolphins or you know so on and so forth? Pacific Ocean, are you sure it's the Pacific Ocean or are we counting you know, certain things? So you're you're getting your you what you know down. You might also put like, well, I know that in a certain square mile in the Atlantic Ocean, 
we have X amount of fix, or maybe, you know, by the way, when you're going to these interviews, you just need to cram your head full of useless factoids, right? Um, like, I know uh, uh, San Francisco is four square miles. Why do I know that? Because I had to memorize it, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, there's a lot of questions, especially if you're interviewing at Google, um, you need to know things about San Francisco, San Francisco Airport, you know, those are things common that they use, and so just know how many people travel through in and out San Francisco Airport in a day, uh, 1.2 million, and, um, you know, because everybody needs to start somewhere. So you can say, I do know, I just so happen to read in an article, there's 1.2 million people who go through San Francisco Airport in a day, right? And so you can write that as a fact, right? Um, and it's very useful. Another question would be, how many airplanes are in the air right now? Well, I don't know. But I do know there's 1.2 million people flying through San Francisco in one day. San Francisco is a medium to large airport. There's about 150 medium to large airports in the United States, and San Francisco is 1.2 million. So let's say the average is probably about 1 million. Uh, through all these, that's 150 million. Um, people flying in the air throughout the day. Let's cut up the, the flying hours are about 12 hours every day. And so you split that up by 12, and then you start figuring out how many aircraft and so on and so forth, and you get the math. So I started with how many people are in an airplane. You know, I'm from the walking through San Francisco, right? And so the idea is you, can, you need to grab a hold of something, and so the more you use the fact the ways you know, the easier you're going to get closer to your question, right? So, assumptions, um, always make assumptions. You cannot solve problems without making assumptions. So make assumptions, but write them out. Like, I'm making an assumption there are so many airplanes in the, you know, uh, taking off and landing, and that the average capacity of an airplane is 180 people. I'm just making this up now. And so you write that as an assumption. And then when you do the math, so you start writing oh, over here. You start writing word equations. So basically you start creating like, what is the equation I need to create? You write the words, and then you do your math in the middle. So in the middle is where you get into your scribbles, right? On the sides is where you keep organization. And so you create your word equation. Eventually when you start pulling the numbers, you start entering numbers, you do the math, boom, you write an answer at the end. Um, and then you draw a line up, it's like, does this make sense? And so you're like, okay, so it says there's like 190 million people in the air right now. Does that make sense? Um, no. Okay, so let's take a look at the edge cases. Maybe there's an edge case, like are we talking small airports? I would put small airports in as an edge case because Cessnas don't matter to, to my math, right? Um, and I'll, well, maybe there's more of a maybe sessions, Cessnas do matter. Maybe some of my assumptions are wrong. So I start evaluating my assumptions and my edge cases. I can fix the math, redo it, and see if it makes any more sense. By the way, the answer is around 5,000. <laughs> the funny thing is, I actually knew that before the question. Because I've read it in an article. So. <laughs> okay. Prioritization. So I'm going to go into prioritization. You rarely are going to do prioritization as an exercise. In so, though you may. Who, who has done a prioritization in itself exercise? Okay, so a few of them. However, prioritization is actually something that is used within a lot of these questions, um, especially the product design group of the product. And so, just really quickly, don't overthink prioritization, right? I think people tend to create too many options. I always create three items that I'm prioritizing, and I have three things that I prioritize it by. And here are just some examples. Um, you know, user value, which could be enjoyment, love, or usefulness, effort or ease, speed of time, and that's development. So one thing people tend to do is you need to make sure you're high, medium, and lows, and I would only do high, medium, and lows. This case is simple, it's three. Um, high, medium, lows is that they tend to, you need to make sure that all highs are positive and all lows are negative. So instead of saying complexity of development, which is a high, would be a negative, you actually need to flip it around and put effort, ease, speed of time for development high would be less. Does that make sense? Just make sure you're comparing apples to apples and not apples to oranges. Um, monetization, competitive growth, so on and so forth. And so what you do is just say high, medium, low. And this is where picking three things that you want to prioritize, you definitely want to stack the deck. 
You want to pick something that is a, uh, you know is going to be the winner, but it's not so obvious. You know, but hopefully they don't all know, right? Um, and then something that's going to be kind of in the middle and something that's like, maybe it's a moonshot, right? Maybe it's a moonshot idea and it's heavily costly, it's going to take a lot of time, we're unsure if it's going to have user enjoyment, maybe. Um, so it's going to be a lot of lows there. That doesn't mean you don't do it. Maybe we have a long-term strategy, but you know, for the purposes of the prioritization, you just want to keep make sure that you have some. You don't want to end up with a medium on everything, and then you actually prioritize nothing. So let's talk about the product design whiteboard. Um, so what we're seeing here is again, rewrite your question in your own words. It's really important for this. Um, write the goal. Why are we we're building a refrigerator for the blind? Right. Um, then I write this. This is really important. I actually write my okay. Just so you're on the, just so you know where I'm going. This is generally how I approach a product design question. I figure out who my users are. I try to figure out what the user pains or problems are. I'm going to figure out what are some solutions to that. I'm going to figure out how I'm, is that going to be implemented. I'm going to figure out how am I going to know it worked, and then I'm going to give you my recommendations. Boom. Okay. What you just did is you created a roadmap on the question you're answering, and you wrote it down. Another thing you did is you actually made it very easy so you don't forget where you're at. Because again, when you're in brainstorming, you tend to forget, like, okay, wait, where am I? Right? Oh, my total interview. Right? So it's it's great to write this down, and this way the interviewer doesn't get lost and neither do you. Do you work in the middle like normal? Um, and what you're going to do is you're actually you're going to talk about the users, right? So you're going to Dig down, like, okay, what user, what type of users? Are these for blind adults? Are they for blind children? Are they for fully blind people? First, you need to kind of like figure out exactly what the question is asking. But you're going to eventually come up with particular users. So, a family who is uh, blind, um, or so on and so forth. And you're going to write your information about your users over there. And you're going to just keep on knocking it out. You're going to talk about uh, the pain points. You're going to prioritize, by the way, between each one of these, you're going to use that. Prioritization chart we just mentioned. So you're going to prioritize which user do you really want to focus on, right? So you're going to prioritize in the middle. You're going to choose a user, then you're going to solve the pain problems for those users. That user that you chose, that demographic, that segment. And then you're going to prioritize. And then you're going to go to solutions that solve the particular pain, pain you chose for the particular user you chose. And then you're going to prioritize. And then you're going to talk about how you're going to implement it. And then you're going to talk about how you're going to measure whether it was effective. And then, of course, you're going to write a recommendation. And you're going to say, so I believe this is what we should do. I can tell you this is the user group because of this. This is the, this is the pain we're trying to solve. And I believe that is the right pain because of what I said. The solution, then I believe this is the right solution, as you see, because of what I said. And this is how we're going to carry this out and implement it. And this is how we know we did the right thing. And I believe this answers our question and meets the goal of the question. Do you believe this is a great answer, or would you like me to go to any point in this process and to dig deeper or change or change something? They're either going to say, "Oh my gosh, I follow this completely. How amazing! Can I work for you?" You know. Um, so this is really great. By the way, guys, whiteboarding this works for your normal product management or any type of work. But of course, we tend not to work exactly like this in such a tight deadline. So final thoughts. Um, I always go back to being a great product person and being a great interview person are completely different skill sets. Completely different skill sets. You can be amazing at product management and absolutely terrible at the interview. I've seen it. People tell me, like I, 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 like I said, I mentor people for uh, Google interviews. And they come to me and like, oh, I just got a Google interview, it's next week. Um, I need some, you know, can you mock interview me? And I mock interview, and I'm like, dear Lord. Like, you should have started six months ago. Like, I have no doubt you're brilliant, but you should have started six months ago. You're terrible. Right? Good luck, good luck, right? Um, but interviewing is improv. You need to be act, you know, be able to move on your feet. Nobody answers how, you know, questions like these in 10 to 15 minutes in normal life. This is just not something we do. What they're trying to figure out is how you think, 
And so part of this is being agile, being move on your feet, interacting with the interviewer, um, and uh, you know, being user driven, show empathy, um, control the cadence of your voice. Um, I you know I always, often give the example is like when people ask me um, list one of your uh, you know, a product you would like to improve, and so I, I said let's let's pick waves, and you know I'm pretty high energy right, and I was high energy in an interview, but I picked waves and I'm like so just let's slow down a moment and think. Waze is the only product that Google made that actually kills people. Think about that. People are in traffic and they're trying to change and they have to consider their death. This is user experience in Waze is a life and death situation and this is why I want to work on this product. So by creating that cadence, I created empathy and I slowed the cadence down because I said, we're talking about something serious. The product is serious. Product kills people. How many of you have killed people here? Please don't be <laughs> um, But it's, it's true though. It's true though. Like some of us work on products that actually could hurt people um, or create addictions. And, and I'm a big believer in ethics and product. And so I definitely bring that in. Um, I didn't cry on cue, but maybe they did a little bit. Um, and I did a little <laughs> The other thing is engaging the interviewer. So. You know, number one, the interviewer is secretly asking one simple question, beyond skills, right? Do I want to work with this person? Are they going to be an engaging, fun, and intelligent person to interact with? Or am I going to be like, oh, I have to work with this person, right? Uh, in an interview, everybody's asking this question. Can I tolerate and deal with this person? And you want the answer to be a strong yes. Okay, so you need to collaborate with them. Um, you need to brainstorm together. And you need to get them to agree with you. There's a lot of tricks to that trade. One thing, though, I think as product people that we are trained to do, and we, this interviewing is the exact opposite. So when you're creating a product and you ask your stakeholders or people their opinion, you don't give your opinion first because you want to understand what they think without creating bias. Right? Is that, is that true? Like You want to create bias. You don't want just a bunch of yes people. You want to hear what they say because you know what they say might be important or it might not be, but you want to be able to judge of that before you give your opinion. So the difference in an interview is if you keep on asking, well, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, does this look good, does this look good, um, they're going to think that they need to hold your hand a lot. And so there's actually a thing on these interviews that says hand holding, right? So you want, does it need hand holding? So every time you engage, you need to make sure that you strongly state, like, I believe this is the answer. I believe this is right. What do you think about this, right? By just flipping it around, you're saying, I have a strong opinion and a strong view, and now I'm engaging you to give yours. By doing that, they're not going to mark hand holding, they're going to see collaboration. So that's the only difference um, in the interview than in real life. Because in real life, you don't want to like bias the, the, the pool. In an interview, you need to show that you have an opinion and you're a leader. Okay, resources. So we have uh, meetups. So we have Product Hire Dog Club meetup, which you can go there. Um, we give talks every month on how to get a product job or job and product, and recruiters come and always welcome. Um, the next one is March 31st and then April 21st. And then we also have Product Job Club for small groups, and these are regional groups that are kind of like mastermind groups where people kind of meet up in communities, like five or six people, and kind of walk through the job process by walking going through a book. Strongly recommend it. There's a meetup uh, downtown we work on Monday night where we're actually going to come together. But you need to sign up at productjobclub.com in order to, to be a part of that. Um, who's been part of a product uh, job club? So yeah, there's several of you. Raise your hand. Actually, stand up. Stand up, because I want people to see you. Yeah, I know. Stand up. Okay. Ask them questions about it, because they can give you ideas on whether it's useful. I think it's strongly useful. At least my group was. I don't know about the other group. But um, definitely. Right. And then there's all these, like, product hire, obviously, selfish plug. And pminterview.com, because you can get interview questions there. Pram, <laughs> mockinterview.co, mockinterview inside. And then product and options, where you can join the Slack community. So again, uh, thank you, thanks to our sponsors.
feel free to reach out to me. I'll even do a video call with you if you have questions. But we'll take questions now. Yeah. Just are we out of time? I don't know. Almost time. Somebody know. Well, no one's drugged me off stage, so ask away. Uh, yeah. Actually, why don't you come up here and ask a question because I'm having a microphone on right now. I know. Voice as well. My question is, I still don't know how many fish are in the ocean. How many fish are in the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I answered that, and uh, I was fifteen percent off, which is pretty dang good. Yeah. Um, and I can. Well, how how would you approach that? Well, I know Columbus sold the sailed the ocean blue, and he thought it was twelve thousand miles wide, or and it's actually twenty-four. So I'm able to understand the circumference of the Earth, understand the percentage of the world that's ocean, but understand that probably about eighty percent of ocean life is around the coast. And so I was able to do a calculation of the square miles of ocean. And then I realized that's a bad idea. Let's put it in kilometers and much easier math. And um, by the way, I'll do everything with metrics and round everything, round everything to big zeros, right? And um, and I came up with something that was about fifteen percent off, which was great. And then the airport one, I was uh, I think five percent off. Which the goal is not to be accurate, like right. The goal is to how you think, but it's really impressive when you know you're right. Right? It's pretty cool. Okay, other questions? Yes, Josh. Uh, in terms of so I, this is a lot about like kind of the content of what you're saying in terms of the conversation itself do you do you find there's a sweet spot in terms of how much you're talking compared to how much they're talking so i think a lot of people by the way i, I highly recommend do 100 mock interviews that will seal the deal right but i find people tend to stress out in interviews i have fun right like these these are my buddies right I and mean, we're like trying to solve a problem and so you know, obviously, um, you you read their body language and how much they're willing to give, but you make sure that you're not you're not creating the impression of handling. But like, you're just two people trying to solve a problem, and you're solving you're leading to solving another problem, and and you're trying to get their feedback whether they like it or not, right? And if they agree, and sometimes they jump in too. So the answer is you got to read the room. Right? Too much, too little, it's all about the purpose of the interviewer. Yes? I struggle with the mechanics of writing on a board. I'm a left-handed guy, and I feel like my body and my hand is always in the way. Okay. How do you actually like handle the marker, and do you have so, any practice? So the answer is, that's why people, if you use only part of the whiteboard, you're always going to be in front of it. Right? That's why you have to use the whole whiteboard, make sure it's a big one. Right? Obviously, hopefully they have a big one. And that's why you walk, or like I would call a walker, right? And so, yeah, I might write, you know, if you're in left hand, you know, you can write, but you gotta walk away from it as you think. So get in the, you know, get your good shoes on, right? And do the dance, do the tango with the whiteboard. Um, and that'll, that'll help you out. You know, if you, if you can't like angle your body properly, then at least get away from it, you know, frequently. Yes? So, business model canvas is big, right? And you know, if you want to use it, you can. Uh, I just don't think it lends itself to an interview very well because there's a whole lot of different sections. It's harder to memorize. This is much easier to memorize. Um, it's very much more simple. It's also business model canvas is if you're actually trying to replicate one, it's a lot, right? And you're probably not going to get through the question. So I, I definitely recommend a, more of a framework like this. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you're going to do a lot of extra work if I don't need to do it. Yeah, I mean, the answer is, um, so usually 15 to 20 minutes to pull out one of these questions. But one of the things I do um, if it's behavioral questions and things like that, is I always not say at the end when I answer. I always try to get the thirty second answer, and then I, I you know, obviously not everything for thirty seconds. But I always say like, does this answer your question, or would you like me to go more in detail on one of these three things? Right? The answer is they're in control of making me go in detail, and so that's why I'm, you know, that, that's that's better to so keep on feeling that out. But I've been in places where these estimate 
estimation questions, they, they actually use that time to five minutes. And they try to create um, artificial pressure, like how many cups of how many lattes does Star Starbucks stop you serve in an hour? Was one of the questions. Their goal, and they say you got five minutes. All right, so it, the time limitation is, is something that Google doesn't do, but certain companies do do to see how you work out the pressure. And if your math falls apart, or some people, quite frankly, give up. Guys, don't give up. Don't say like, oh my god, like no, have fun. Like, oh wow, this is such a challenge. Let's do it, right? And um, I mean, if you give up, like it's automatically you sucked, right? And you didn't get the job. If you didn't give up, you know, at least you have a fighting chance. So, other questions? Uh, let's do. Yes. How do you deal with like this? You make assumptions. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're an intelligent human being, I'm sure. I'm like, well, you want to just raise your hand? No. no. Okay, so, so you know, obviously your assumptions are probably more well educated um, than probably some people's, hopefully. And so, yeah, you, you have to start somewhere. Sometimes you have to start with an assumption. Just make sure that they agree to the assumption. It's like, I'm going to assume this. Is that okay? Right? And they'll say yes or no. Uh, you had one? Yeah, I was just wondering about the etiquette. Uh, if you have weird numbers, even though they're rounded off, right? If you have 532 million divided by 165,000. Yeah. Uh, could you just pull out your phone and do the math, or is that bad etiquette in those situations? Probably bad etiquette. Okay. Okay. Uh, set yourself up for success. And make sure you have far more zeros than, than real numerals. And just like, you know, you got to be good at math. You got to practice. I hate math. Right? I love calculators. Um, that's why God invented calculators, right? Um, the thing is, you don't get to use it, and plus you don't have time, right? And so the funny thing is, I've made math mistakes. And, and the guy says, like, this is right, and that's why you go back and check your work, right? And the funny thing is, we both laughed, because the interviewer did math mistake too. So, because he was like, well, is it this, is it this? Well, maybe, and he was like trying to, and I'm like, he was wrong too. It was, we were both wrong, we just we laughed. Um, it's normal. Just don't block calculator. Speaking of not giving up though, have you ever had anyone that had the like guts to just Google the answer when they asked it? Others? Last I don't know how long we're probably work. Anything else? Okay. Thanks a lot. Go for the best. A quick announcement, if you have the schedule pulled up